All right, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, Ricky, if you could go to the next slide. So hello, I am Christy Rivalski, the Senior Training and Consultation Spe uh, Specialist with the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And I am excited and honored to facilitate uh, today's session. Thank you for joining us for session two of our Learning Forum Healing School Communities in the Context of Racial Violence. Where do we go from here? A couple housekeeping items before we begin. As many of us are working from home, I am sure that many of you have become very comfortable with Zoom uh, video meetings. In any case, I want to share a few reminders regarding the technical logistics of today's meeting. We have made every attempt to make uh, today's presentation secure. If we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we will follow up using your registration information. Uh, to ensure the best audio quality for the duration of this meeting, we have muted mics and uh, for all participants except for the speakers. If you have a link or resources you'd like to share with uh, other attendees or questions for the presenters, uh, please enter those in the question and answer pod. We have uh, team members monitoring the Q&A pod and they will ensure the facilitators receive your questions. Uh, to open up the Q&A pod, you just hover your cursor over the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your window and click on the Q&A function. Uh, we have scheduled ample time for Q&A with our guests towards the end of the meeting, but uh, please feel free to enter your questions at any time uh, during our session today. If you have audio or technical issues during the session, the chat box is open for you to communicate with a member of our team, so then that way they can assist you. Um, a reminder that captions are available for today's session. For those who would like to enable or disable, just click on the closed caption button on the bottom of the Zoom platform for options. Uh, you will receive an, an email following the presentation on how to access um, a certificate of attendance. Uh, the session recording and slide deck will also be posted on our website within a few days. And, and if you don't already, please follow us on social media and stay in touch with us. So again, welcome. If you are new to us, uh, this is a two-part series and a collaborative effort of the Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers, also known as the MHTTCs. Uh, we are a network funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration, SAMHSA, the MHTTC network includes 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. Our collaborative uh, network supports resource development and dissemination training and technical assistance uh, and workforce development for the mental health field. Our, our network also has a specific initiative that focuses on school mental health, uh, school mental health, specific activities put on by the MHTTCs through the School Mental Health Initiative encompass multiple service moves, uh, various topic areas and populations. This learning forum, forum is just one example of the training that we offer uh, the School Mental Health Workforce, all free of cost. We invite you to visit our website to learn more. We'll add the link in the chat box for everyone. After today's session, we encourage you to visit our website and find your regional center to keep in touch uh, with more resources and training opportunities. And just a really quick disclaimer, this presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, the opinions expressed in this learning session are the views of our moderator and the panelists and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. And as part of receiving SAMHSA funding, we are required to submit evaluation data uh, related to the quality of this event. At the end of today's training, we ask that you please, please take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's session. Um, all attendees will be automatically redirected to the survey when closing the webinar window when this event ends. So really quickly, I just wanna mention um, our principles. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. 
That language is strength-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, um, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, a uh, person first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear and understandable, consistent with our actions, policies and practices. So we could just take a moment to reflect on this and remember to apply this to our dialogue as we move throughout our time together today. So before we get started, I want us to really just take a moment to settle in. I really want to invite you to engage in a grounding exercise. Help bring breath into your body because sometimes our breath is not readily available to us. I want to offer up a few ways today. The invitation for today is to find a connect deeply with our joy, the joy of breathing, bringing a gentle lift to the corners of your mouth, the joy of the last time connected with a loved one, colleagues or friends, the joy we find in this very community in learning and lifting up our collective wisdom. Use your breath to honor, make space for, and root into that joy today. With each breath, the messages and things that get in the way of sitting with your joy get smaller and your connection to your bodily wisdom your strength grows, deepening your embodiment of joy, taking more space, more life, and taking a moment to come back, acknowledging that this breath, this feeling is available for you throughout our time here together and beyond. Now, Let's get started. We are so pleased to invite Ebony Edadio to moderate both sessions of our learning series. We welcome you back, Ebony. Ebony is a skilled facilitator, educator, community organizer, scholar, and so much more. Ebony, thank you for being with us today. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that wonderful grounding and introduction. And welcome all, thank you for having me once again. As um, has already been said, my name is Ebony Aredayo and I am a graduate student at the University of Minnesota earning a PhD in curriculum and instruction with minors in African-American studies and culture and teaching. I'm focusing on culturally affirmative curriculum in the K through 12 classroom, as well as institutions of higher learning, placing particular emphasis on the wellness of black women, students, uh, teachers and faculty in higher ed. So this conversation really hits home and is important to me. So let's talk about why this and why now. Just a few words to frame this conversation, healing school communities in the context of racial violence. It's a two-part learning series intended for everyone who tends to the wellness of children. This space was created, we know, tending to the wellness of children means that we are also navigating the impact of racial violence on student mental health. This is a lot for us all to hold. Our intention for this series, for this discussion today, is to offer a conversation that focuses on strategies for supporting students' mental health while navigating racial violence, both in and out of school, opportunities for the field to improve its commitment to fostering a workforce ready, able, and willing to hold racial violence as a mental health issue, as well as steps we might take to advance school mental health supports for students experiencing racial violence. Today's session focuses on learning from and with school mental health workforce 
cultural keepers, practitioners, scholars, advocates, and systems leaders. Just as we shared last week, this is not an all-encompassing how-to. School mental health is complicated work. Navigating the impact of racial violence is complicated, complex work. For some of us, this is an entirely new conversation and others are very familiar and part of this everyday work. We do not expect that two 90 minute conversations will address everything, nor should they. To that end, we offer a couple of working agreements for us as we listen in. To all of us, we will be listen and reflect mode. You are invited to submit questions for the Q&A portion or send resources you would like our network to promote. Agree, argue, aspire. With what do you agree? With what do you argue? To what do you aspire? Expect and accept a lack of closure. We won't be able to get to everything today and that's okay. This work is ongoing. To our presenter guests, we agree and commit to making space for each other. Stepping in and stepping back when there's a question posed to us all. And we commit to keeping our thoughts brief, spoken from our role and our experience and respecting the frame and nonpartisan audience, and audience of our network and raise your finger when you want to speak. So I wanna briefly introduce the panel and share the flow for our conversation. If you are joining us for the first time today, you are in store for incredible dialogue, insight and wisdom and scholarship from these wonderful presenters. Dr. Moorhead's powerful work centers culture as a protective factor to oppression and his research elevates the ways culture turns the tide on adverse life expectancy indicators when it is presented, respected and honored taught to children in school. Tiffany Marie's scholarship and practice draws conclusions between racial stressors and health outcomes and it doesn't end there. Her research speaks to our psychological capacity to restore and also amplifies the critical role culture plays in our wellness. For 20 years now, Jerrica Coffey has developed curriculum and pedagogy that facilitates young people in developing a critical consciousness, academic identity, and skill to challenge the social toxins that are pervasive in the communities that she teaches in. Nor Joan Bay's work, voice and scholarship does the heavy work of prioritizing joy, pleasure, and humanity in spaces that will otherwise negate it. Her research explores the brave cultivation of joy across generations as resistance to the racial violence. Dr. Tabakui Bailey's scholarship explores the many ways we might internalize racism and is training critically conscious school-based mental health practitioners to join school communities in partnership with the students that they serve. And Jorge Santos is finding meaningful ways to humanize learning in school spaces by centering relationships and intentionally building a culture of restoration and ritual within school structures in his classrooms. So that's the dynamic panel that we have for us today. So we're gonna to transition to our discussions and I'm gonna first start by asking each panelist to share five, uh, you have about five minutes to share your current work, your research and your passions as it relates to supporting the mental health of young people. We will go in this order, Tiffany, Marie, Virgil, Jorge, Jerrica, Noor and Tom Bakui. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Tiffany to talk about her work. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, my work really looks at the pedagogical practices that are, it's two part, both necessary to attenuate the harmful toxic stressors that our young people embody. And then the other end is both studying um, and implementing the types of practices that are necessary to maintain homeostasis, their health and their well-being. And so, so much of my work really follows this trajectory. This is a 2010 paper by uh, folks at the University of British Columbia who looked at, and they did this examination on what they call weird societies. And it's an acronym uh, for Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic societies. And so much of that work uh, began to understand that most of what we do in America is like the outlier. America is even different than the Finnish and many other folks who still are getting this idea of what is necessary to center young people's wellness in their practice. And um, so my work really 
is following studies around how learning happens and how um, best to cultivate that for young people so that it leads to their wellness. And so much of what we do, as we talked about in the last class, uh, session, is, is really antithetical to young people learning and young people being well. But my work seeks to center what, what a lot of folks have been doing. It engages this idea of remembering because so much of what we do is nothing new. Uh, but it's about returning to practices that we know will sustain ourselves. And what we know about how young people learn is that children learn best when they can mimic adults, when they're surrounded by older and younger people, by grandparents, when they're immersed in the natural world, when they're free to play, to move, to exercise their bodies, to follow their curiosity and uh, to experiment. And a lot of times our young people are punished um, for their experimentation, really their adolescent development. And so we seek to um, engage the type of practices that really help them to, to do just that, to learn, to grow and to be well. And we know we center in that process um, that if a, a child of ours, uh, just like so many folks in certain parts of India, if, if children walk towards something and they attempt to uh, engage in and they don't want to and they walk away, we leave them alone because we know that they'll, they'll return. Um, we know that our young people learn really well through stories as, com as compared to lectures. And so we engage storytelling and in, in real life experiences. We know that our young people learn best from imitating other children. Um, and that learning doesn't happen in a linear way, but, but more like the, the Maori suggest in a, in a more um, like a stairwell, right? And so, so much of our practices center the, the studying of this the implementation of it with our young people, um, and then the attempts to educate others to, to perpetuate these practices. And so right now we're engaged in um, a really, really powerful study that um, is both, or not both and, is, is, is looking at their engagement with the natural world, what's happening to them from a um, neuroscientific perspective, what's happening to them from a physiological perspective. And we're really attempting to counter the impacts of colonization as opposed to oppression. And when we talk about oppression, we're talking about those things that we see every day. And so ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and those things become really important when we're thinking about measuring oppression. We are looking at the impacts of colonization, um, maybe even what we call Stockholm syndrome, and how we have developed really, really loving relationships with our oppressors. And so we're seeking to um, disentangle those things and look at the impacts of what it means for us to have such intimate relationships with the very institutions that were designed to kill us and to counter those with um, our practices. And again, centering this idea of remembering. And as I close, I wanna engage Toni Morrison's idea of remembering uh, of memory, she says, you know, in certain areas where they um, build uh, houses and such by the Mississippi River, often the water comes back and it floods. And she says floods is, flooding is the word we use, but really it's memory. Um, and our work, though it may seem destructive to these structures that exist, it's really us just returning to what we know. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, Virgil would love for you to share your work, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you again for having me. Uh, you know, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and currently the executive director at Two Feathers Native American Family Services here in Northern California. And, and our work is about really rethinking uh, mental health and wellness for Native American youth and their families as is. And so in order to rethink and, and do that work, I think we have to, we start from a place of, of recognizing that we're in a, uh, what my mentor, J Dr. Joseph Gaughan talks about a sort of post-colonial predicament within Native American mental health. And, and that predicament is, is on one hand, there's urgent mental health needs, there's urgent needs in our communities and there continues to be due to ongoing colonization, ongoing oppression, assimilation. So on one hand, there's urgent needs 
And on the other hand, there's incongruent clinical services. And so we try to answer how to meet those needs and how to be creative in thinking about mental health and wellness differently for Native American youth and families. And so what I, we're been finding that's helpful and what we're trying to do is that all starts with grassroots movement, community organizing, getting out in the community, building relationships. It starts with that. And then it starts with also at the foundation, infusing everything with culture. And when I say culture, I mean the traditions and practices of our people, that we have solutions, we have wisdom, we have sensibilities that are the solutions to our current ills. And so grassroots movement, culture, and then we get into engagement and connecting with youth and families. And then that after that engagement, there's trust that's built, right? And then after all of that, then there's the sort of conventional mental health interventions, talk counseling, you know, talk therapy, other things. But without the grassroots movement, without the uh, culture, without the engagement and trust, you don't have any mental health interventions. And then once you have the mental health interventions, you have to think long-term, seven generations out. That in order to, to, to solve and, and, and really trans improve our communities, and when I say our communities, I mean the ones that are often the most disconnected, the ones that have sort of faced the brunt, continue day in, day out of ongoing colonization. We have to think just seven generations out. And so that's sort of our model of trying to, to solve that, that post-colonial predicament that we're in. And I think really, if I were to say it in one sentence, is thinking about mental health and wellness as medicine that we can't be about compliance. We can't be about you got a court mandated therapy. You, it, it can't be about that. It's about our community seeing that a counselor like myself or a mentor or a social worker is medicine. And if we don't have systems and institutions and ways of being that promote that, then we're not gonna transform mental health. We're not gonna transform anything because we can't continue to try to force people into things. We can't be knocking on their doors and tell them they're gonna, their kids are gonna be taken if you, go, if you don't go to counseling, right? And so I think really mental health programming as medicine is what we're trying to do. And that all starts with community organizing, culture, trust building. And then we get to mental health and solving some of that complex trauma solving some of those ACE impact of those sort of ACEs. Uh, but it has to be all about trust, respect, and looking at it as medicine. And that's what we're trying to do at Two Feathers. I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, I thought I unmuted. Jorge would like you to come in and share your thoughts and share your work as well. Thank you, Evan, I appreciate it. So I'm a restorative justice coordinator out in Brooklyn, New York, and my job is really to shift a, a culture, right? Which is always punitive, um, places discipline on our, our children, specifically black and brown children. And I do think that there is power in restorative justice. Now it's become a buzzword, right? We hear it all the time, but to me, it's a philosophy, right? It's a way of life that really stems back to the way our ancestors used to deal with community and, and their relationship with the world and, and people. And I think that one of the coolest things about it when we're sitting in circles and we're doing this RJ work, our ancestors sat you know, around fires and circles and told stories. And Tiffany made a really great point, like storytelling is part of our culture. It is how we learn, it is how our students learn. So for us to bring that back into our schools where our students make mistakes and then they can reflect on it and have a conversation with their peers about what happened it's empowering our students' voices. And one of my passions is student voice because as a youth, I didn't feel like I was accepted in school. I didn't feel I was able to be who I wanted to be, right? And it, I was being, like my identity was being removed from me, right? I had to conform to a system. So as an educator, as an art restorative justice coordinator, my goal is to empower their voices. I want our students to be heard. So we're thinking about shifting this culture um, 
we're not using restorative justice as a, an alternative to discipline, which I've been hearing a lot. It's like, no, we want our students to be able to be who they are, be accepted, um, build community, build relationships. How do you form these social um, emotional uh, skills to form relationships with your peers, with your um, administrators and, and teachers? So I think circles are a really great way. One of the things that I do is like circle keeping and facilitating circle discussions anywhere from academic circles to social emotional support circles, family circles. We bring in families to find out, hey, how can we support the family, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, there's the term it takes a village to raise a child. And I do believe that, right? It's not just the student, it's like, well, let's, in, let's incorporate the parents. Let's have parents, you know, speak about what's going on at home. How can I support? And then you start to see how you can actually support the student when you see what parents are going through. Uh, when there's conflict among students, mediations, of course, and being able to just have a, a conversation, right? Which we want to model that for kids now. When you have a conflict, sit down, let's have a discussion. There's nothing that a discussion can't fix. And that's critical for our students to understand at a really um, early age. Um, also med uh, meditation, right? Our students are dealing with a lot of stress and we know that schools are not a conducive environment for our students of color uh, with the stress that, and trauma that they receive there. So being able to learn how to use meditation skills to deal with that, um, having them take a second to just sit down and really just silence the world, right? And, and reflect and then restart and go back into the um, classrooms or wherever they're at that they need to focus on. One of the things that I've, I've really been proud of last year that we were able to launch, it's something that the Black Panther Party used to do uh, in the Oakland School, which is the Fairness Committee. And we were able to incorporate that. And I think it's such a powerful tool because students are the ones leading the discussion, right? So if a student causes a harm in his community, it's like, okay, it's not the teacher telling you, hey, you know, this is messed up. It's students, right? And it's students with the lens of not being punitive. It's like, hey, why did this happen? What's going on? Is there something going on deeper? Like, why would you do that? And then that student that's, you know, calls the harms starts to be like, oh man, I messed up. And it's okay to mess up. Like we need to tell our kids, it's okay to mess up. School is a simulation. This is where you're gonna make mistakes. We shouldn't traumatize our students because then all we're doing is labeling them and they grow up with that label. And, I, and just the other day, uh, when I was in school, I had a student that told me, yeah, I'm a bad student. And I was like, why would you say that? He's like, I just say I'm a bad student. And I know why, because teachers have removed him from that classroom. And every time a teacher decides to remove a student from that classroom, they know the label that's coming with that. So we have to be very critical to support them in being a part of the community and not removing them from the classroom. That's where teachers really have to do the work around de-escalating. If you feel like you need to remove a student from your classroom, then I'm sorry, you need to do more work on de-escalating the situation, right? And start seeing our children as human, and not as someone who is a threat to you. And that's where like, we really got to start doing that work. Um, more work around identity building and being inclusive. Our students need to be accepted no matter who they are, um, supported by our teachers. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is building that sense of belonging in the school. I think that it's proactive, right? We're going to limit um, conflicts among students if they feel that they're accepted in that space that they're in. And we have to value their uniqueness and their worth and really start creating opportunities for our students to be creative, use their imagination and flourish in, in their classroom. So that's some of the work a little bit and I'll probably bring some more stuff into it as we go on. Thank you. Thank you so much for here, Jerica. Would love to hand it over to you to also jump in the conversation. All right. Thanks folks who came before. Um, I learned so much from listening to you and feel uh, grateful to be part of sharing space here right now um so when it when it when it comes to this question of like addressing racial violence and how we move forward i feel like the my my passion or my interests really lie in figuring out how in my classroom space i can create containers through curriculum through building culture that um, allows for students to process grief um, grief work has to be part of addressing and healing racial violence. Um, and so to that end, I, if, I, if I may, I wanna bring in the words. Um, some years ago, someone gave me a book called um, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. If you are doing work with youth around grief or work in your community around grief, it is a powerful, powerful, book that helped me understand the transformational power of grief. Um, 
And so uh, Francis Weller, who wrote the book, says that our activism is directly connected to our heart's ability to respond to the world. A congested heart, one burdened by unexpressed sorrow, cannot stay open to the world and consequently cannot be fully available for the healing work so needed at this time. And this piece is so powerful for me because it started to help me understand why grief needs to be held in, in my classroom space and how as an English teacher, I can do that through writing exercises and through engaging students in healing modalities while I'm also teaching academic literacies. Again, it's not an either or, we talked about that a little bit in the last session. It really is about creating what Stephanie Cariaga, she's um, a researcher out of um, CSU Dominguez Hills, she calls it a pedagogy of wholeness, right? And so to that end, um, I've been over the last few years participating in some healing collectives that have been really important because as, as a teacher, right, I can't be trying to engage healing practices with young folks and I'm not doing that work myself, right? I have to be really living these practices all the time. And so um, there's, a, there's a collective that, that folks, I'll drop some information in the chat about, um, but it's called HELA, Healing, uh, Empowerment, Liberation, Love and Action. It's a healing collective for um, black and brown critical educators here in the Bay. And what we do is we share ancestral knowledge. We come together to share, share and engage in healing practices and, and really um, practice collective care. And for me, this like democratization of healing has been such a powerful thing to participate in because I think for a long time, I thought my healing was gonna come from like a, sitting with a therapist in a room. And it wasn't until I got into these collective healing spaces that I started to realize this was this was resonating with me. And the reason why it was resonating with me um, was because there was a vulnerability, there was a collective process, um, and, and it was really um, a place where I'm, and has been a place where I'm learning and practicing the practices that then I'm going and bringing to young folks in my classroom. And so I just wanna shout out um, Dr. Farima Porcochet, who created the space. She's done some writing about it. I'll put uh, uh, some links in the chat. And, and most recently in the last uh, year and a half, we started before COVID hit, we started working with another organization called Healing Together. And Healing Together um, is, is working to bring justice-centered, um, peer-led uh, healing spaces to pr promote emotional wellness. I've learned a lot of practices um, that I've then brought to my students. And so I, I, I think that that the way forward again is, is for me is creating spaces for students to process pain and grief. And of course, there's gotta be room for joy, but, but really learning and embodying these practices with other critical educators and then, and then bringing them to my classroom after I've, I've really like learned the contours and, and all of the, the shades of, of what the practice brings, these practices have bring, are bringing to my life. Um, so yeah. Thank you. That's a great segue to talk about Nor and your work. Thank you so much. I've been taking all of these notes. Uh, I just really thank you for all of your brilliance. Um, and uh, I, I, my research, how do I get there? I, I got there from really actually sitting with myself, uh, sitting with my own body in the way that when I moved into certain spaces, my, uh, my, I could feel my body shift. I could feel myself preparing for a, an attack. And most of the time that was in schools, right? Or most of the time that, but also not even just that, recognizing myself as a black woman, a black young person moving through the world, uh, that there were many places that I didn't feel safe, um, that I didn't feel like I could say my, say my truth. Um, and when I did, that there would always be some sort of kind of pushback, right? Um, and in some ways feeling isolated, um, my research comes out of me recognizing that I'm not isolated and that I'm actually a part of a, a lineage, right? Which I think is something that as an educator, um, as a student, I felt very isolated navigating a lot of my educational experience. But as an educator, my question was, how do I connect um, these experiences that I had in my own body um, with young people and help them to navigate the things that were really hard for me? Um, as a researcher, my job then is to understand what are those things that I'm bouncing against in my everyday life, whether that's walking uh, 
home to school to the grocery store, whatever that is, or when I'm navigating my job in an educational institution um, that when we have a wild class with the young people and they're playing and having a good time that all of a sudden uh, some of our white colleagues are like, that sounds like a bomb, like it was a threat to have these black children screaming and, and giggling because critical literacy should not have that type of joy, right? Um, so there's these moments for me, my research is really grounded in navigating multiple roles in the field of education and then also grounding my different experiences in my body um, and the reactions from other people, right? So where joy became a thing, even in my school space as an educator, if I cultivated it too much in my classroom, that would be something that would get me reprimanded by other teachers. Also, because I have a young looking face, people on the street, if they think I'm walking with young people and I can also see the experiences that young people get, the kind of aggression that is put towards them when they are loud, when they are joyful. And most of the time, the people who are entering or engaging with them have no idea what they're doing, have absolutely no understanding of what's going on in their body or what they what happened through their day, have not listened, did not create a space for them to be honest about their expressions or what they're going through. Um, and so that's the baseline of my research. And it's very much tied to my own personal story, but also in me asking connects back to a lot of what everyone has shared is that it's not just the isolation of not seeing other black students in the classroom but also this isolation of our lineage of our history of the different connections that we have uh the his, uh both the intellectual so a big part of my research is looking through archives so looking at the experiences of enslaved women um uh, from 1730 to today listening to their narratives listening to letters listening to uh notes of that people wrote about them because there's a whole process of understanding our history that also is very much guided by uh what we're seeing in schools today which is a misreading uh not listening to the experiences of folks but really marginalizing them in this really um re reductionist kind of history which only talks about pain which only talks about colonization which only talks about the ways in which whiteness interacts with blackness for exploitation, for the creation of wealth for a particular part of you know, the world, right? Don't want to go too deep in that. But um, my, my goal behind joy is, is that joy is something that we move through, right? In the same way that grief and moving through different systems in the world start to, uh, I think, in my body, but also something that I've heard in a lot of my research uh, uh, community, um, and I say that as a community because one of the things that I do is I cultivate spaces for us to talk about what we're experiencing. Cultivate spaces for uh, intergenerational uh, communities of black women and girls and gender expansive femmes to come together and say, what is it like to get an education in your body? Where are you getting that education? And we also talk, just to kind of also connect, the difference between school and education is always happening when they're talking, right? What, is, what does it feel like to be in that institution? What does it feel like to actually learn and grow? And, and what, what, what I've shared in, in other places when we talk about culture, when we talk about community and relationships, that's how they define education, right? And there's this punitive uh, aspect of schooling that they also are very much aware of because they live through it every day. So when I think about um, my research, it's really centering knowledge as, as being something that's produced in our bodies as we're navigating the systems, but also recognizing that our young uh, black women and girls and gender expansive femmes also have knowledge from the history, right? From the, their families going through school, navigating different systems. And it's interesting to hear these resonances, right? Where a daughter can say, I had this experience in my class and a parent uh, and uh, there's a, some really great, uh, one of the greatest, I love this book, but Ghosts in the Classroom, um, that talks about the ways that we can be re-traumatized through school because a parent has also experienced that, right? Or a great grandparent has also experienced that. And so some of the ways, um, so my research is focusing both on creating a space for us to grieve, to process what, what's happened, to tell the truth of the story. And one of the things that's beautiful, y'all, is that when we can actually tell the truth, joy comes. The problem of 
of, of what we're, we're saying, like, how do we cultivate joy? We allow young people, we allow people to be in their bodies, to express themselves truthfully and honestly without punitive repercussions, which is one of the main reasons that comes through all of my research. And I, I work with the Girls for Gender Equity. And I say that I also am a researcher that is very much connected to intergenerational community that's outside of the academy. So one of the, the communities that holds me is Girls for Gender Equity in, in Brooklyn that teaches me all the time around what consent looks like as a researcher, as an educator. And that's the first thing is when we think that we're coming in as healers or we're coming in with, with a good intention, is it really good? Does it actually feel good for the person that we're interacting with? Um, is this something that they want? When we talk about what is the, the intervention, if we're not working side by side with the young people to talk about what, what is that thing that allows me to feel better or move through this grief or move through a, what, I'm, what oppression feels like in my body, then, then what am I really doing? So the thing that I, I recommend in my joy Nora, research. Nora, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, we're, we really have a really tight time schedule, so I want to transition over to oh, Tom Bequie okay. to share his insights as well. Thank you, but everything you said was absolutely beautiful. Tom Bequie. Um, thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna really be short because I think the the point of being here is so we can get to some questions and really get in the dialogue. So thank you all for allowing me to be here. I saw some people from Maryland, so give a shout out to Maryland. I saw somebody from Decatur, Georgia, one of my hometowns as well. So shout out to that person. Uh, I'll just say. Um, uh, similar to Virgil in a way, I'm trained as a, as a psychologist, as a counseling psychologist. Uh, I've worked with um, um, training I'm in higher education. So I am um, training individuals who want to be counselors and psychologists. I'm also an uh, assistant vice provost for equity and inclusion uh, at my university. And so really working with the university to think about DEI initiatives and efforts. Uh, I think for me, in terms of my research, really looking at multiculturalism and then uh, Black psychology. Um, one of the things I'll say is I think it's really important that we understand our identities and how it then, particularly people of color for Black people, how that impacts our experiences. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just actually stop there for now and really get to a space where maybe we can have a larger dialogue and as things come up in questions and, and definitely want to hear more from our peers. Um, so thank you, Ebony, so much. Thank you all. Let's do transition to some of the, the questions that we have for our time today. And if each panel will panelists would take no more than two minutes to answer these questions. And we have, have a few before we can transition to um, questions from the participants as well. Let's start off by thinking about what might it mean for our children's psychological and mental health to have to go somewhere every day where their humanity legacy and even holistic future is negated in over in nuanced ways. What does that mean? And who would like to start? Well, maybe I could start us off coming again, um, being trained as a psychologist and thinking about mental health. So what does the research say? So um, Ebony, to your, to your question, when young people are experiencing these, these settings where um, where they go to places where their humanity, their, their future, their, the legacy of who they are are negated. What do we see happening? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the, what is at the end is we see low attendance, right? So we see people aren't coming to school and then we see that there is low academic performance and achievement. That, that's the end result in terms of what we see in terms of their school relationship. But in terms of their mental health, what do we see? Well, we see an increased level of depression. We see increased levels of anxiety. We see um, an increase where oftentimes when we start thinking about suicide, um, suicidal ideation, self-interest behavior, it's often not talked about for black, for black and brown kids. What we actually see, if we look at the literature now, that when we start thinking about black, Latinx, Native American, indigenous children, we see that they are some at the highest incidences or rates of um, um, suicide attempt. And so we really have to see that then it is this negation of um, these experiences in school. I think somebody in the chat wrote this idea. Um, Jorge was really talking about um, how, do we, how do we keep children in the classroom? And somebody said, you wouldn't kick somebody out of their home. And that's true. And so children, when they start to experience this invalidation, and that's what's happening, it does have a psychological and physiological effect. 
and that that psychological and, physio and physiological effect then impacts their ability to gain a, um, to be in school and to then achieve and to get some level of education. So I'll, I'll leave it there and I, I welcome comments from our peers. Thank you. Would anybody else like to take that question on? I'll go. Um, just to touch a little bit on what, about what Tom Bakui was saying, um, and, and obviously I'm looking at it from more of like the teacher in the classroom perspective, um, it's, a, it's traumatic, right? It's an infringement on the identity of our students and their worth. And, and just thinking about what that has, like what impact does that have on a student? Um, and, and we have to acknowledge the, the generational trauma of, of race, of racism and the social economic trauma on black and brown folks um, and that relationship with schools. So, you know, this is an environment that is, it's not conducive to their learning. So, you know, thinking about that impact, right? Why would you want to attend school? And then you lose interest and then you become disconnected. Um, students become disenfranchised with school. And I think Tiffany last week had talked about there's a huge difference from school and education, right? So being disconnected from school is going to impact also their education because they're going to be like, well, that's all the same thing as they're getting older, like, I don't want to know about education, I don't want about school, you know, that it's a traumatic place, I don't want to be there. Um, and what you get, and, and you know, you, you have to ask yourself, well, how is this system designed, right? Because then what's happening is that it's feeding the school to prison pipeline, right? It's capitalizing off of the exploitation of a failing school system. So that's critical for us to understand what impact um, mentally does that have on our black and brown communities. And um, th that's something that we have to think about as we're talking about um, schooling itself, it's like, well, it's a place that we don't really feel successful in. And anybody knows you don't want to be in an area where you don't feel successful or accepted. And that's something that um, is, is super traumatic for any student. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, I want to ask this question and ask Dr. Moorhead to start because you've talked a lot about um, culture as a protective strategy. So wanted to ask you what cultural strengths within BIPOC communities serve to counter the harsh and heavy realities of growing up in a racially violent climate and how can we make space for those strengths to be central in our learning spaces? Yeah, I think, you know, I think for one that we have to remember that the mental health field education is a foreign concept to indigenous communities because the mental health field, the, the whole profession of psychology, you know, comes from Northern Europe and comes from ways of being uh, in, 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 in perceptions of personhood that's different than many indigenous communities. And so we have to start from looking at, well, what are the, the, the beliefs, the ways of being of indigenous communities? And I think specifically, if we don't, then you know, that's where it's dehumanizing. That's where, like Corey's talking about, that we we don't honor and respect the 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 who the person is and where they come from. And I think specifically one of the ways that this it uh, has an impact is is medicalizing, psychologizing social issues, structural issues, and really, you know, how we even talk about things such as trauma. Like that's a medical term, right? How we even talk about things, you know, I think that that causes many of at least the, the youth and families that I work with to say that I'm the problem, mm. right? That let's fix me. And so I think the the culture, yes, we have to, to, to bring it to our belief systems and our ways of being as indigenous people, but we also have to decolonize and deconstruct the mental health field. And what I'm saying is, is that not looking at it as a medical psychological yes that's part of the story but it's also existential it's also about purpose about meaning about identity and so i think uh if we talk about culture we have to talk about all aspects of uh one's uh sense of being and where they come from and if we don't that's where it becomes a problem and how it often becomes a problem is is, is you blame the, you blame the native you blame the individual you blame the parents you blame the family and that's where I think it's detrimental. Thank you so much for your contributions. Would anyone else like to add to what Dr. Moorhead is sharing? Yeah, 
Yeah, I can quickly, uh, and I appreciate that that emphasis on um, the ways in which there's deficit understandings of how we understand what's going on, and it may be internalized. And uh, I, you know, Patrick Kamanyan talks about the difference between horizontal violence and vertical violence. And often so much of what our research and what we're trained to pay attention to are horizontal forms of violence, the ways in which we interact with each other, even the, the initial ACE survey um, was really focused on all these dynamics in the home. And without this analysis of vertical violence, the type, the conditions that actually create horizontal violence, then we are really just uh, supporting a field of research, particularly that relies on our suffering for its maintenance. And so, so much of what we do and how we move forward um, and really to prevent us being continuing to be reactive, which is what the academy really relies upon, is for us to have, in some ways, an important analysis of vertical violence in every single conversation that we have. And then also to remember and return to, um, to Dr. Moorhead's point, that the practices and frameworks that we know and, the, and using the language that we understand um, and that we've used for years to sustain ourselves in understanding what it is exactly that we do. Thank you, Tiffany and Marie. Um, here's another question for us to consider. How does, what does healing look like? Feel like, what does it sound like within the school setting? And what could healing-centered schools mean for the communities our students represent? And when we think about this, who must be at the table when we're defining healing? What programming, staffing, roles, and types of conversations must be present when centering healing in our school communities? And what kinds of learning spaces for educators and school-based mental health practitioners need to be cultivated in order for healing center practices to be sustained within educational settings? I can try really quickly. Um, I, I, there's this thing where the nation understands that prisons have to go. That's an argument and, it, and it's legible and it's clear. I'm just confused as to why that logic has not transferred to schools. And um, Nora raised this point that really uh, resonates with me from our last discussion around anyone committed to healing. Cause I don't know what a healing centered school is. As, as a healing centered prison to me. Um, but anyone committed to that work is really about being in that space and being committed to the types of work that allows it to die. And, um, you know, I always tell this story of, of Circe or Circe from Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. And so you have Macon and you have Pilate who are the children and their father is killed. Their father is killed in front of them. And Circe gets them and she attempts to protect them. She brings them to where she works and she's feeding them. And at some point in the novel, we realize that she is attempting to hide them in the very house of the people who murdered their father. And teachers on a daily basis, including my 15 years into this game, have to come to terms with the fact that we are doing the very same thing. We are attempting to hide children, protect them, to feed them in the very house the, of the architects who have murdered their ancestors and continue to murder us. And so anything that is serious about healing and healing centered at some point will rely upon us doing just as Cersei did later in the novel. If she sat there and when Megan Jr. came back, it stunk, it was decaying, parts of it were falling because she was committed to its rightful demise. That's such a powerful story, thank you. Others would like to add on this question. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, this is actually a, a route to, uh, that's really important to me is narrative and storytelling. Um, this is something that aligns communities globally in regards to what resistance looks like. Um, and I think there's this, I love this Audre Lorde quote, but basically she says, there's no ideas, just new ways of making them felt. And I think the important thing when we talk about what it means to heal it means to cut a like the, from a from our, if I'm looking at the enslaved women's uh, resistance movements, it means we will burn it down. I know that seems real intense for a lot of people, but what the big piece behind it is saying, every 
I recognize at both points the way oppression is cutting at me. And I also realize I also need to uh, build and create a new space for me to also heal. And there's a lot of scholars who write about this. Christina Sharp talks about we're in the, uh, one of the ways that narrative is powerful for us because it helps us to use metaphors. We can get caught into this idea of cycle. Like this is, um, I'm gonna put a pause real quick, but why I, I believe it's important for us to have our different forms of knowledge as we move through education and through schooling. But it is really important for us to demystify what our roles are and what our knowledge is and how it is useful and in align with what young people and families already know. What are the stories of resistance that they hold? What are the ways in which they already understand what it means to fight against a system that has worked to eradicate them since beginning and be here breathing, right? And a part of that is respecting the languages and the ways in which they come to know themselves and what it means for them to be healed, right? And so for me, what that means is saying that a school that centers that is comfortable with saying, we don't, we're not doing it right. We don't know. Therefore, what are the things that have helped you to cultivate? And when I say joy, I say like, what are the things that have helped you to move through the grief, the pain, the sadness, the oppression that you experience every single moment of your day that are not that is not yours, that has been passed down generation to generation? And what, how could you imagine or feel something different? It's creating space. When I say cultivating joy, for me, when I think about that in relation to community, it's not about filling it up with the words that I already know. It's about returning back into the narratives and hearing what folks were saying and reading it with new eyes that are not deficit framed. It's sitting with people, with elders, with young people and saying that I need to find a way to make this space. And if that means that I have to make it at 6 p.m. or 8 o'clock and bring food and, and put some music on so that folks want to be here, <laughs> I need to find a way to do it, right? And so for me, it's being comfortable with, with the point around uh, this, I think what we've been saying over and over again is that the way in which we've been taught to do this is violent. Even if we're saying that we're putting meditation here, even if we're saying we're doing, you know, like these ideas of what healing is, if it doesn't feel free, freeing for the people that we're sitting with, and it hasn't been built in a consensus, mo a consensus model that also connects to their historical lineage, is, this, is there healing in this, right? Um, does this feel good, right? Um, and so for me, a, a big part of what that has looked like, and I'll be quick, because I know sometimes I can get on mine, but art that has been meeting, creating spaces for art making, for expression, for music, for dance, for folks to show up as they are. And again, I'm navigating between school spaces and after school spaces, which oftentimes get it a much better than we do in the, the classroom spaces. And so that means that there needs to be a dialogue, a way of that we're really honoring different types of knowledges that are not given to us by an institution, but we are recognizing that oftentimes the way that we're speaking and thinking about these things are actually um, oftentimes you know, uh, making the people's experiences invisible. So for me, cultivating joy says I need to make free space. And how do I do it? I ask the people who I want to help me make that new, that, that space of joy. You know, if I can, if I can, uh, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna push maybe a little bit on, on my sisters and I, I appreciate your comments. Um, you know, I, I think about, and, and Tiffany, I know you were talking about this a little bit in terms of this abolitionist, the abolition movement, particularly as it relates to the the prison industrial complex and the move away from that. You know, when I think about education, I, I don't know if I can wholeheartedly say the same thing. Respectfully, please, please hear what I'm going to say here. Um, I, I appreciate what you all are saying, but when we look at, if I take a, a city like San Francisco, who are the ones who are using public education above and beyond? So in San Francisco, the population of, of black and brown people are um, different than what people think. Let's say, 20%, let's say even 15% of the population. However, 80, 80 to 85% of those students are in public education. And so if we decide to blow up a system for which the majority of the people who are using are people who look like us, and if we don't replace it with something, then we may not be engaging in the healing. Brother Jorge was talking about restorative justice. Restorative justice typically has four parts. It has this part where there's accountability of the perpetrator. There is the voice of those who are victimized there is the collective conversation and there's the input or the collective decision from the community. And so I'm not sure if, if to take something away 
without some some type of 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 intervention that that I think we may be left without. And so when, when I start thinking about healing from a mental health perspective, the first place we go to healing is the person who was harmed. We have to ask that person, what is safety for you? Then we say, what is contributive in the environment that is causing the hurt and pain? But now I can't say that I have to, to, to throw that person out or who they are. What I have to do is change their environmental experience. Now, I, I also will say my work is in higher education. And because of that, I'm constantly training counselors and psychologists to go into these systems. Because my belief is that we need individuals who understand the multicultural competencies. We need individuals who understand social justice. We need individuals then who can go in and, and make a system that is once stiff, more malleable to change. And when we start thinking about critical mass, I think my understanding of how I see critical mass is, how do we have a critical mass to change a system and I say it because I'm, I'm constantly working, I'm constantly pushing people into the system. And so I think for me, I think about how do I, and, and now what I will say is, <clears throat> the, there, is, there, is some, there is a need for revolution within the system, but I, I often wonder what happens if we totally get rid of the system. And so those are my thoughts. Again, no disrespect to, to, to my colleagues, I value what you're saying. I think it's just a, for me, I, I recognize this need to be in that system. Would anyone like to respond to the like the dynamic here, the the tension that's being raised? It's a, it's a really important tension, and I'm really grateful for it. Again, as I said, it's nothing new. Um, Kendra uh, Watson and I uh, wrote a piece called Apocalyptic Education, and in it, part of what we are describing is this idea of apocalypse. And when you look into um, white literature, Western literature, apocalypse is listed as something that is very scary and intimidating. Um, but when, and, and, and it, it makes no sense. It's, it's framed in our movies as something really devastating. But when you read black queer women's analyses of apocalypse, it is something that we celebrate. Because an apocalypse, the only people who are fearful of an apocalypse are those who have benefited from the oppressive structure. Those who have been stepped on, those who have had their backs bent the entire time, when they stand up, of course those who have been standing on them fall and that seems violent and just horrific to happen. But those of us, and it may seem odd for me, I don't go by doctor, I don't even share my last name often because those are characteristics and outcomes of rape, of kidnapping, of enslavement. And so while I have navigated the institution and it may seem weird that I have a critique of it, I am a survivor of it, but I am not married to it. I do not desire intimate relationships with this thing that kidnapped me and taught me that I should gain my validation through it. One other piece is that what I hear a lot of people say are two really quick things. One is the language of abolition should never be legible to those who are seeking to uphold those structures that are hurting and harming other people. So it's, it doesn't make sense for a language of abolition to be translated or to make sense to those who believe in or want to sustain the academy. And lastly, what, what I hear a lot of times with this is that we have to have alternatives before we can. And that is so assumptive. And that when we were kidnapped and brought here, so many of our people actually never touched plantations. So many of our people were in maroon communities that existed outside. We have always had alternatives. We have always been engaged in acts of remembering and sustaining ourselves. Really so much of what we're attempting to do in apocalyptic ed is to remember that. And that the alternatives are already here. Mm. And visibility is antithetical to abolition. I'll say that again. Visibility is antithetical to abolition. Harriet Tubman would never post flyers of where she was meeting and advertise the work that she was doing because it is antithetical to abolition. And so I wanna say the work is being done. The alternatives are here. They have been here, but visibility is antithetical to abolition. 
I would love to get Jerrica or Virgil in on the conversation um, before we transition to the, to the next question. Not wanting to put you on the spot, but wanting to make sure that your thoughts were brought into the space. And thank you, Tiffany, for your remarks. Yeah. Um, oh, Tiffany, it's so hard to go and say anything after, um, after you because um, your brilliance got me all like feeling uh, just so energized and and it's and I can't even I can't even uh, pull together anything half as brilliant but but what I will say that that may just kind of reflect and and expand is that you know when we think about this this question of like you know what does healing look like in a school set, set setting I do agree that um, that healing in school are not um, that you know it, it you, you can't heal um, I don't think in, in a in a toxic relationship right you have to actually remove yourself from that relationship to be able to get yourself together and show yourself up to heal and what we're asking you know and me as a teacher what I'm asking students to do when they walk in the door and I'm creating this safe container um, for them to do um, writing that's healing and to, to look at pain and explore grief I'm asking them to open up a wound um, in in a in, in a place where that that wound uh, can fester and that wound can 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 get even deeper and that's a big ask and I think about that tension all the time um, and and yet that's where that's where my people at, are at for right now and but I, but I but just to 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 reiterate something that Tiffany said the alternatives have been around they were always around we had education before we were colonized people so this idea that if we don't have school we're not going to have education is 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 a, is not something that resonates with me at all um, our people have always been educating the next generation and so what what for me the work looks like is really paying attention to as i open up space for my students how I keep them safe when they leave my classroom and they've they've been opened. And you know, I think that that's hard. That you know, I've made a lot of mistakes around that because the, where do they go from there? You know, and that uh, so so it's something that I'm still learning to tend to, but that again is where you know I'm I'm in a healing collective with like three or four of the teachers in my school. So there's a group of us that students go to from grade level to grade level that that can create that container because we're practicing together. And, and of course, that's just small, small time, like in the moment, but we're also building outside. And so, um, so that's, that's my, my little two cents, but I guess I want to, I want to close by just saying that, like, for me, you know, the nature of white supremacy culture is to compartmentalize, is to fragment, is to alienate, is to marginalize. And so whatever ways in our school spaces and our community spaces that we are we are integrating, that we are being whole, that we are inviting wholeness and 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 practicing it, it, it is what is going to move us uh, uh, beyond white supremacist culture in our classroom spaces and in our community spaces. And so, you know, the, I, I feel like we, we do need to think about all the ways that we're tending to the mind, the heart and the body as we're doing this work in, in whatever space. Um, but, but again, I, I, I really believe that um, abolition is not about tearing down. Um, it, it's about building up, but building up from before building up from before we were colonized people. So I'll end it there. Yeah, I could add a couple uh, things. I think, you know, I think the arguments is not either or, it's both and. And I think, you know, around the healing component, what, what I'm finding is, you know, that so much of, the work is, you know, and Angela Davis is, talks about this is like, you know, you do social movements, revolution, but we have to be healthy and well and balanced in that. And so how do we cultivate in ourselves? How do we help to develop more people in our communities that are pro-social, that are good team players, 
that are are critical uh, in their thinking and really develop more folks, whether you call it a abolition or youth development or whatever, it starts with the people. And so, and, and the people have to be balanced and well and healthy. And we grow up in systems and institutions that don't promote that, capitalism being one. And so how, how do we develop healthy people and develop healthy selves? Because without that, we're gonna have competition, we're gonna have division, we're gonna have not working together as a community because we have to create synergy in order to really transform systems as I see it. And I think that it really needs to be centered around healthy people. In many indigenous communities, if you, if you didn't get things done as medicine people, you were kicked out of the community. So in our traditions, we have, let's get outcomes and results. And, and I think what I'm suggesting is the outcomes and the results is healthy people, balanced, spiritual, connected to themselves and in, in developing our youth to think outside of themselves and work together. And that's where our best and brightest and our resources need to go. Because if you don't have healthy, balanced people, I don't, I don't, it, it doesn't really matter as I see it because that's what it takes. It all starts with the people. I want to agree. Is it possible for me to enter in or Ebony, do you have another question? Well, what, one thing I was gonna ask in regards to the conversation that we're having here now, can we talk a little bit about how this, this concept of abolition, whether we are for or against somewhere in the middle, how does it tie into student supports and supporting the well-being and the mental health of our students? So if we could just tie that, that piece in, but yes, go ahead, Nora. Um, so I just wanted to completely agree with um, what Virgil just shared, but also with um, how folks are reflecting. I think the and, and, both and, is something that we learn when we listen to people. We listen that they're navigating complex experiences. When I listened to the archive of enslaved women who didn't have options <laughs> um, on the outside, right, in the ways that we do, but found ways to resist and find places for healing, find places for their families to be able to, uh, to share the stories and the histories and the legacies that were not corrupted by enslavement, by colonization, then we start to learn, again, I think this is what Tiffany and also Virgil is bringing up and Jericho, we start to learn that the work of resistance, the work of healing, the work of joy and wellness is not something that is being passed down in dominant institutions, right? And we recognize the dominant institutions that we are navigating are, uh, for the most part, exploiting us, right? Our, our, the natural world, our, our young people, our bodies, and there's large, lots of literature on this um, in the historical sense, also in the socio, uh, social sciences, uh, in economics. We can go through, I could give a whole literature review because that's what dominant education teaches us. When you move through the system, you see black, brown, indigenous people from a deficit perspective. Um, and a lot of that is because they don't have access to this knowledge because we have not been trying to give that knowledge, right, in a sense. Um, so my point that I really want to connect us to, um, and I don't like to give direct answers because I think the big piece that we're all pushing is that it's about the people. It's about us who have the space and the time to be at a panel like this, to start generating questions for the communities that we work for, for us to start learning that they have the gifts to give us in regards to how to start shifting and navigating our processes of working and also unlearning so much of what we've been taught to succeed in dominant education for us to then create the space for which joy can happen, where, where grief, um, when Jerrica's talking about what it means to hold space for the young people, it meant that she had to really think critically uh, in alignment with communities to say, what does school look like now? What, mu what must my classroom look like to offer or say that I, this is a healing space? Um, it, it's only a healing space, and a lot of Black feminist uh, writers talk about this, is that our work is responsibility. 
So it's not enough to just call it, but it's like, what does it feel like for the people that we're working with? Do they feel balanced? Do they feel whole? Do they feel well? Um, which is when I think of abolition, when we talk about when I, when I say burn down to make really clear. So um, for folks is that it means that we're, we're comfortable with knowing that we can disrupt much of what we've been taught in, 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 in our learning uh, for us to then shift and build new spaces, new ways of being that are actually um, offering a healing and wellness for people and recognizing that we don't have the answers and we must ask, we must be curious, we must constantly reflect on our what we think we know. Thank you. Any other thoughts to this before we move to some audience Q&A? Yeah, I, I do want to touch in. I, th I think this is a great conversation, right? And it's, and it's a um, conversation and debate that can go back and forth. We are operating in a in an oppressive structure, right? Like this is we know this, um, but I still think the idea of a space, right? If we're going to talk about healing, when when I'm in a classroom, right, I can uphold white supremacy culture, or I can dismantle and disrupt, as Nora was saying. So, like, you know, if First off, like if I'm in a classroom, like I, I think last week I had told I had a kid that threw a paper airplane, right, in the classroom, and I, I didn't make it a big deal. I was like, cool, be a kid, right? Now we know in, in, in a normal, not normal, but in a classroom that upholds a lot of these white supremacist culture, they're gonna send them out. Like, what are you doing throwing a paper airplane? Get out, that's not acceptable, right? So it's like little things like that that we start to question, like, well, wait a minute, how do I remove myself from a culture that I was brought up on, right? If we think about it, uh, the white supremacy culture, how do we remove ourselves from that? Well, how does that look like? Well, first, I think we do have to acknowledge the hurt, right? The traumas, uh, the generational trauma on um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Like We have to acknowledge that hurt um, in those spaces so that we can begin the healing process. And I think healing, like, like Nora was saying, it has to start with joy, um, being able to incorporate their imagination, their, their curiosity, um, the arts, the music. And I think that the space, like for me, I, I hate the concept of having to, like kids sit down at a table, like, yo, can we throw some couches up in there? Can we just like change the whole structure of school as a whole? Because, yeah. you know, we've been educating our kids throughout the beginning of time, right? And, and we know that education and learning can happen anywhere, not just within those four walls. So that can look completely different. I think as educators, we have to rethink and reshape and transform what do we want our classrooms to really look like? Do we want it to look like a factory where students are lined up, hands folded, you know, raising their hands? Like, I don't even have kids raise their hands anymore. I'm just like, just speak like a normal human being. Like in life, you're not raising your hands all the time. Like you just speak, right? So it's like things like that, that we start to like decolonize ourselves and move away from. And I think that the more we do that, we start to create a space where it's, it's no longer that, that oppressive form on our students. And, you know, we see it happen so much where it removes that, that idea of being an individual. So I just want to talk a little about that. And, and I do believe like, it's a conversation that we could have all day. <laughs> like that one, that one idea, we could go for three hours. Or more, like there are dissertations that are written on it. So it's not something that, I mean, we said at the beginning, these are two 90 minute conversations. We can't solve everything. And now that we're talking about abolition and the schools, like that's a whole nother, like five, six, seven part series on its own. Um, but thank you all for engaging and participating in that way. I do want to take a few questions from the audience so that we can get other voices in on our conversation. Here's one. How can we extend this framework to our coworkers, especially folks who are not of color? How do we build balance in healthy schools and healthy departments? Anybody want to try at that one? Um, there was a question that came up like this, and I, so I'll start us off. But I don't, I don't, I, I don't have a fully developed thought around this. But I, I have been thinking about it since uh, our last session, where somebody asked about allyship, and I really, I really feel like. What I wanna say about this is that white folks, you gotta get your people, right? And so like, um, and I think Nora, you brought this up in, in the last session too, like it really, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't fall on, on us or the few, the handful of, of teachers of color or counselors of color that you have, black and brown folks on your campus um, to do that work. Like white folks have to create the, the spaces to work with each other 
to, to also heal from white supremacy and all the ways that it dehumanizes you as well. And so I feel like um, I, that's just the piece I, I wish I would have said last time, but I think to start us off on this conversation of what it looks like, it, it looks like white folks stepping up and being brave and, and, and working with other white folks to, to also, um, you know, imagine um, what anti-racist spaces look like on your school campuses and what what, and engage with these frameworks from the perspective of, of white folks, right? Thank you, Jerrica. Others wanna add, but then also, like also to your point of getting white folks, are there resources that you can think of? And I have one, I'll put it in the chat. Are there resources that people can think of that can help white folks collect their own folks? But also others wanna chime in on this conversation. I just want to offer one resource, the work of Brie Pickauer. Um, uh, she, she works with NICOR and um, does research around whiteness and education. She's coming out with a book right now uh, about this very topic. So I'll put her information in the chat. Anyone else? Well, you know, I'll say that um... So Rosalind Pellis says that allyship is good, but we actually need co-conspirators. We need people who are actually involved in the fight. Um, and so to just give a pat on the back and say, as somebody walks out of a meeting, I think Norm made this, this point last week, oh, you know, I'm, I'm right here supporting you. That, that does nothing for you in the meeting. And so we need co-conspirators. We need people who are actively involving in the dismantling of white supremacy and white supremacy policies, behaviors, and interactions. I think those things are critical. Um, I think that a few years ago, people felt allyship was enough, or a few years ago, people thought, um, if I just understand this notion of social justice and, and, and that inequity exists, that that's enough. Um, but really what we're saying is that I'm just okay with observing this process unfolding. And so I do think we, we need to then, um, we need to, to have individuals who are co-contributors, who are co-conspirators with us in this process. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of texts. Uh, Annalise Singh, she writes a, a book in terms of um, thinking about um, kind of racial healing, but then really starts to, in that book, talk about how do we address microaggressions. Um, you know, um, Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist. I think it's it's moving. I think there are, there, are, there are a lot of good pieces of information out there. Um, I think oftentimes what ha happens, and I'm talking to <clears throat> my allies right now, is that people are just okay with being allies. And so they don't look for these materials. We could throw, you could throw a rock and you're going to hit 50 different texts. You know, Sister Tiffany was talking about the stuff that she's doing. This is not esoteric material that you can't find. So we could put 50, I, I'm sure that we all attend shop, you know, workshops, panels all the time. We get 50 different pieces of information. The question is how many of those pieces of information are we opening? So I think we have to move away from allyship. I think we have to move to co-conspirators. I think we have to have individuals who are actively engaged in the struggle to change these systems. So, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I think that's what's important. I just wanna share a quote um, from Monique W. Morris who wrote the book, Push Out. Um, she wrote, when we prioritize discipline over learning in our educational institutions, we engage in a reactive politics that maintains a status quo of inequality, right? So I think that's important for educators to know that. And then starting to see like, okay, where are these inequities in the school system, right? What are the policies? What are the practices that you're contributing to that is keeping that status quo of white supremacy? Starting there and then beginning to dismantle and remove those policies and practices to create, right? Because if we're talking about the idea of abolition or transforming, well, then we have to look at these inequities and start changing them. So I just wanted to mention that real quick for, in regards to like the perspective of what educators should be looking at and thinking about when they're in these spaces, look at the inequities, right? If we know that something is, is creating a, a, a sense of a disadvantage, change it. Like why continue that? Uh, there was something I, I've been having a conversation with my faculty about, you know, small groups and, and Zoom and noticing that when we're breaking off that students of colors aren't really sharing in the small groups. And I'm like, so let's stop doing small group. Let's engage them a different way, right? Like if you notice something isn't working, why continue that? All you're doing is causing an harm. So we want to look at those things and start talking about that, inviting people into those conversations as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned push out. So my last question, I'm going to start with you and then 
have everyone else kind of fill in as you as you can. And I'm going to attempt to put two questions that I think might be slightly related together. We'll see how it goes. Um, can can anyone speak to the symptoms of mental illness and BIPOC youth being labeled as behavior in the long term impacts of lens or just like classroom management and how we try like you talked, Jorge, you talked about throwing the airplane and how, like what your response was versus what another teacher's response might be. Um, but then I think also, what about, how does this relate? How does this connect what we're talking about to the school to prison pipeline as well? I know those are loaded pieces, but uh, let's see what we can do in our remaining time together. I'll, I'll just go really quickly and just mention a few things. I mean, we really have to steer away from zero tolerance policies. We're dealing with children here, right? Um, and, and we know that the term zero tolerance even comes from the prison system and the criminal justice system. So, so the fact that it's also embedded in our school system really says a lot about how um, the school system tries to maintain that school to prison pipeline. We really need to dive into um, kind of like what Virgil was saying about the holistic being of our students, right? Um, having conversations with them about uh, self-awareness, uh, motivation, decision making, that's critical, right? These are the spaces. This is where we want to have that. So if a student is, for whatever reason, having an issue, get to know why, ask them, find out, talk to them, see what's going on. That's critical. Many, like I said, many, we wear many hats at our schools. If you sign up to be a teacher and all you wanted to do was teach science, well, good luck with that right? Because that's not what you're doing as an educator. You are having conversations about what's going on at home, what's going on with families, and you also need to be vulnerable yourself and share that. If we start focusing on relationship building, then when things happen in the classroom where a kid throws a paper airplane, it doesn't become a big deal. Well, it's because you know the relationship and the, the dynamics have changed with that student. The problem is people want to uphold that dynamics of the teacher being the authority figure, Right. Um, which for me, and this is my personal experience as a young student, it was like I saw teachers as police officers. Right. So imagine if that's my experience, if I'm seeing teachers as police officers, then teachers and educators need to understand oh, that's your role, too. When you're in that classroom, there are many students that are looking at you as an authority figure who's hurting them. Right. Begin changing that dynamic. Right. And how do you change that? Well, you don't uphold a lot of the you know, things that have been taught in education that you need to do. Right, I'll keep it there. I know other people want to share as well. Sorry, Evan, you're on, on mute. Yes, uh, we have like two minutes left. And so who would like to have the last word in this round of questions? I don't want to have the last word, but I did want to say something. So okay, I'm, say something and then somebody else can jump in. Cheers <laughs> after. I I really am pushing us toward a reevaluation of, of what's healthy. And um, it, often in schools, we celebrate, I think, the people who are the most unwell, which are, including myself, I've been rewarded for years to sit within the most adverse conditions. And that's who we reward in our society, the people who, um, sit still amongst the fire. And those who I would argue, both from a public health perspective as well as a sociological perspective, those who are the most healthy when something is on fire are those who are screaming and kicking and trying to get out. And those are the people who we have policies and practices in place for. Even when, you know, unfortunately our ancestors were kicking and, and screaming for, as they hung from trees, those are organic processes of strangulation. And we need to be able to see what we're calling resistance or even oddly bad behavior in schools, maybe as a sign of health. Those are maybe some of the more healthy people who refuse mm -hmm. to be captured, who refuse to be held. Um, and the last thing that I, I want to say today anyway, on this talk anyway, is that um, I don't focus on abolition. I'm not like, that's dope. That's awesome, it's necessary. But my focus is on wellness and health and healing. And what I do know is there is an, an, a very intimate relationship between the two. If we actually center what is best for children, then abolition is just a natural consequence of that. So I wanna be clear that all of what, I agree that all of what we are doing is necessary in any institution. Uh, well, actually, I, I don't know intimately what y'all are doing, but I would argue the theories of what are being presented is very important. And that each of those steps in protecting children, 
in listening to them, in caring for folks who have been harmed in higher ed. Those are all acts of centering our well-being. And the more that that happens, these actual structures cannot stand. 